An anti-government march in Delhi last month, one of the last protest meetings before the government declared a state of emergency and banned all public demonstrations. The protest was only one of many that have divided Delhi and indeed India in recent months, as pro and anti-government factions have debated the central issue of government corruption. The independence of the courts and government broadcasts on all India radio have been among the issues raised. But the biggest protests were directed against India's Prime Minister, Mrs. India Gandhi. For the tough 57-year-old leader, the issues developed into the biggest political crisis of her career, and characteristically, she's responded to it in direct and dramatic fashion. By declaring a state of emergency, arresting thousands of her political opponents, and imposing strict censorship on the press, she's made an unprecedented break with India's democratic traditions, so carefully nurtured since the country's independence 28 years ago. Mrs. Gandhi has a huge popular following throughout India, and she's relying on it more than ever now to get her new regulations accepted without too much complaint. The immediate background of the crisis is the charge of electoral malpractice brought against the Prime Minister by Raj Naraeem. Mr. Naraeem stood against Mrs. Gandhi in her own constituency in Uttar Pradesh in 1971. He the result. He claimed that Mrs. Gandhi, seen here during the 71 campaign, had illegally used her position as Prime Minister to gain an unfair advantage. Mrs. Gandhi was accused of several offences, including using the state authorities to erect loudspeakers and platforms for her meetings, and employing a government official in a party capacity. Trivial enough charges when set against the many other kinds of irregularities that are commonplace in India. But technically, they fell within the scope of the anti-corruption laws, and Mrs. Gandhi had to answer them. India's constitutional lawyers have had a field day as Mrs. Gandhi's fought the case to the highest court in the land. Although she's been cleared of some charges, she's failed to reverse the injury. She's guilty on two counts. And under the law, she must give up the premiership and be disqualified from holding any public office for the next six years. The best she's been able to do is claim a postponement of the sentence until the Supreme Court hears her final appeal. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mr. Narain has claimed the verdict is not only a personal victory, but one for democracy as well. I have pursued my election petition convinced in the justness of my cause and not in the spirit of uh, pursuing an individual. The issues involved are greater and affect the fate of democracy itself. Today the people rejoice and reaffirm their faith in the democratic institutions of India. I accept the judgment with humility. For her fanatical supporters who besieged her home after the verdict, Mrs. Gandhi is the only person with enough authority and popular appeal to hold the country together, a view the Prime Minister's banking on to support her claim that constant party squabbling was making India ungovernable, that in order to save democracy, she's had to discipline it. And by taking these measures, Mrs. Gandhi served notice that she's not prepared to give up a political career that began over 20 years ago with her father, Pandit Nehru. Nehru was India's first prime minister, an architect of independence and a great constitutionalist. On Independence Day, he spoke of India's tryst with destiny, 
a destiny which he believed could only be realized by India adopting the democratic traditions and liberal values of the Western world. Nehru's wife died in 1936, so throughout his 17 years of power, his daughter Indira was his constant companion and hostess, with a unique vantage point on the exercise of power. When Nehru died in 1964, many people expected Indira to take over, but she lacked actual ministerial experience and chose to stay aloof from the internal power struggle within her father's Congress party. In the event, the mantle of leadership passed to Lal Bahadur Shastri, a compromise candidate between the party factions. But Mrs. Gandhi did enter the government, serving as Minister of Information for nearly two years until Shastri's fatal heart attack in January 1966. It was not the most important post in the government, but it served as an ideal position from which to observe and analyze Congress party politics. With the death of Shastri, the Congress party kingmakers chose Indira in the mistaken belief that she could be controlled and molded into an instrument for their own policies. At 48 years old, Mrs. Gandhi accepted the post, but not the unwritten conditions. She began by adopting a slogan, Garibi Hatau, abolish poverty. In one of the world's poorest and least literate countries, its simplicity had an immediate appeal that transcended party politics and put Mrs. Gandhi directly in touch with the masses. And in the 1967 election campaign, the new prime minister showed that in terms of popularity, she was the equal of her father. Wherever Mrs. Gandhi spoke, the crowds turned out in their thousands, and often hundreds of thousands, to hear her socialist message. But the background to the campaign was one of disturbance and demonstrations. In a country as disparate as India, the threat of intercommunal violence is always present, and there were those who despaired that democracy was strong enough to control it. At that time, Mrs. Gandhi seemed to have some doubts. Well, if violence were to increase, or the tendency of the opposition parties to disrupt meetings or peaceful, um, um, you know, people's speeches and so on, then of course it does make, I mean, democracy cannot exist in the same way. But uh, I must say I have tremendous confidence in the Indian people, and I think that they will not allow this kind of violence. Don't, you don't feel that in these critical years there's any actual questioning of the system of democracy, that people want something else, something stronger, something more dictatorial? The people certainly don't. But opposition parties who feel that they may not have a chance through elections, you see, they are the people who, um, who indulge in this type of violence. If you've got a program and a policy which you can, which is... Um, Will, uh, which can attract people, then you will be anxious to put it forward. It's when there's a lack on that front that you have to make it up by uh, cre creating disturbance. One correspondent has said that this fourth general election may be India's last. Do you think this is a very pessimistic outlook? It's not only pe pessimistic, it's entirely unfounded. Mrs. Gandhi's confidence was justified. The election passed off without further incident and she was returned to power though by a much reduced majority. The new parliament had many problems to tackle. Mrs. Gandhi's approach was to involve the state directly in many sections of the country's life. 
nationalization became an increasingly divisive issue within the Congress party and caused a major crisis in 1970 when 14 major banks were taken into state ownership. But Mrs. Gandhi overrode all objections, claiming it was necessary to ensure a fairer distribution of wealth. When, I, when we say that it's against the vested interest, I want to make it clear that we do not believe that, uh, I mean, we are not against any one group or section of the people. But when in a country like India, there is so much poverty and so much disparity and inequality, uh, there can only be stability if there is an effort made to reduce <coughs> this inequality and disparity. I think everybody realizes, even the, the poorest, that we cannot do away with it altogether in a short time. But I think that if we can show that we are going in a direction where there will be greater equality, people will be patient. But I don't think that any administration can uh, take a different direction. But the nationalization measures were too much for the party's right wing to stop, and the Congress split, leaving Mrs. Gandhi depending on the support of minor parties to stay in office. Again, she met the challenge head on, calling a general election in 1971, a year ahead of schedule, and fighting it with a newly organized party. The campaign took on the air of a family feud, putting into opposing camps party workers who once battled side by side under the old Congress banner. Leading the Old Guard Congress party against Mrs. Gandhi was the former finance minister and deputy premier, Maraji Desai. It was largely due to Desai that Mrs. Gandhi had succeeded Shastri, yet Mrs. Gandhi had no hesitation in dismissing him for opposing the nationalization measures. The new party president was Jagjivan Ram, the then defense minister. He's still a powerful figure in today's government, despite a scandal in which it was revealed that he'd not made any income tax returns for 10 years. Another key figure was Y.B. Chavan, a former home minister, now foreign minister. With this new team, Mrs. Gandhi again appealed to the people for a clear mandate for her radical social and economic reforms. She told the masses that the time had come to elect a government that had deliberately turned its back on conservatism and vested interests. It was a campaign on which she staked her own political future, and she won by a landslide. Early in her premiership, Mrs. Gandhi had cultivated close ties with the Soviet Union, reinforcing a friendship between the two countries that had existed since independence. That friendship was now to prove invaluable as the Indian Premier embarked on her greatest foreign adventure. In December 1971, Indian forces crossed into East Pakistan in support of Bengali secessionists and after a four-week campaign, defeated the Pakistan army. India's victory gave birth to a new nation, Bangladesh, an occasion for great rejoicing not only in the new state, but all over India as well. The justification for the invasion was the million and more Bengali refugees who'd fled from East Pakistan in the preceding few months. Mrs. Gandhi said that feeding and housing them was a task beyond India's capacities, and that in the name of common humanity, they had to be given a chance to return to their own land and live in peace. The government's handling of the Bangladesh crisis disarmed even the severest critics. For Mrs. Gandhi, it was a personal triumph that made her position unassailable within both party and government. Neither before nor since has her prestige been higher than it was in those first few months after India's victory.
But in the next few years, the Prime Minister's newfound authority was to be tested more severely than ever before as India's economic problems steadily grew worse. The main problem, as it's always been since independence, was food and how to produce enough of it. Both the system of land tenure and the techniques of farming are to a large extent medieval and hold back production to a fraction of what the land could yield if it were efficiently managed. Added to this are the vagaries of the weather. There's either too little rain or too much. Last year's drought was especially severe and put millions of peasants below the starvation level. Although the government described the situation by euphemistic phrases like pockets of scarcity, reporters on the spot spoke plainly of famine. <laughs> At times like this, migration from country to town increases dramatically, but those who come to the city find little comfort. India's economy just isn't growing fast enough to employ all those who want jobs. And in fact, a greater proportion of India's population than ever before now live below the official poverty line. India's also suffered more than most from the world food shortage of the last few years. Prices on world markets have soared far beyond India's ability to pay. The government's tried to regulate domestic supplies and prices through a chain of fair price shops. But when supplies are scarce, these shops are the first to run out of stock. And anyway, nearly all the shops are in towns and therefore out of reach of the rural poor who need them most. All other food shops are at the mercy of private suppliers who often hoard their stocks in order to force up prices. Finally, last year came the oil crisis that not only quadrupled fuel prices, but also sent fertilizer costs rocketing. India had no alternative but to cut its imports of fertilizer, with all that that implies for domestic food production. <laughs> The effect of all these pressures was to send India's general inflation rate up to 30% in 1974. Just a year ago, Girilal Jain, editor of the Times of India, gave us a prophetic analysis of the situation. Well, there are many, many kinds of criticisms leveled against the government. You know, the, the left, for example, is very critical of the government right now because it believes that uh, it has gone back on its leftist professions and has not implemented its programs. You just open any leftist papers and you, you, you find that those papers are full of this kind of criticism. You talk to any leftist leader at any level and you find that he's making this kind of criticism. On the right, there is this criticism that the government is, has been, has, is corrupt, is inefficient, has acquired a stranglehold on the economy. The economy doesn't move. It has pumped in so much money into the economy that the economy cannot cope with it. You know, there has been about 12, 14, 16 percent increase in money supply in the last three years, roughly. Whereas you know, the, the r rate uh, of economic growth has been much, much lower. It was about uh, 5 percent in 71, 72. Then it was about 4 percent, I think, or 3 percent in 72, 73. And um, about 0 percent in 73, 74. Against uh, this kind of economic performance, there has been this tremendous increase in money supply which has put a great deal of pressure on prices. And this is a major source of um, discontent as well as criticism everywhere in the country. I'm quite convinced that in the short run, it is not within the capacity of the government of India to solve these problems. And it requires substantial external assistance. I personally believe that the government should be in a position to import three to four million tons of wheat this year along with a number of other important items like a substantial quantity of fertilizer and um, if necessary like oil and other things edible oils
and this requires considerable amount of foreign exchange which India cannot generate by its own exports. That's why I personally welcome the generous assistance that members of the AD India Consortium have provided. And I believe that this will go a long way in helping India meet the present crisis. But even this amount may prove insufficient in view of India's enormous needs. Because if the situation is not brought rapidly under control, a very serious challenge can emerge to popular institutions and the general socio-economic and political fabric. That challenge has now occurred. It's been expressed in a series of confrontations between the government and various groups in society. One of the earliest was last year's rail strike for higher pay. The government refused to concede. It declared the strike illegal, arrested thousands of union members, and sent in troops to man the trains. More troops, this time on riot patrol in Delhi in February this year. They were drafted in after an angry mob had gone on the rampage after disrupting a meeting addressed by the Minister of Agriculture. There were similar incidents elsewhere, notably in Gujarat, where earlier this year, student riots over food developed into a full-scale campaign against corruption in the Congress-controlled state government. Later, Mrs. Gandhi herself campaigned vigorously in the Gujarat state elections, but her party was voted out of office. The central government in Delhi, it seemed, was out of touch with the regions, and not even Mrs. Gandhi could heal the breach. Architect of the Gujarat anti-corruption drive and of Mrs. Gandhi's defeat there was Jaya Prakash Narayan, a 73-year-old pacifist who came out of retirement two years ago to lead a reformist campaign. He's a national figure and has deliberately modelled himself on the late Mahatma Gandhi, whose tactics of civil disobedience against the British were a major feature of the campaign for Indian independence. Among Indians today, he's probably the only figure with a following to rival Mrs. Gandhi's. Mr. Narayan's on record saying that Mrs. Gandhi is so determined to retain power that she'd suspend the constitution if she felt threatened. And yet, it was probably Mr. Narayan himself who allowed that prophecy to be fulfilled by calling on the army, police and civil servants not to obey what he called the illegal orders of their government. It gave Mrs. Gandhi the excuse she needed to imprison him, Maraji Desai and hundreds of other opponents. So, for the time being at least, Mrs. Gandhi has silenced her most turbulent critics, like these supporters of the Jana Sang party, a right-wing opposition group. She set aside the system that made their protests both possible and effective, but such authoritarianism may not be easy to maintain. India, after all, has a tradition of direct protest that goes well back into her colonial history. It would be surprising if it were stifled completely overnight. <laughs> When Mrs. Gandhi accounts for her actions to Parliament later this month, the world will be watching to see what she intends to do with the extraordinary powers she so recently assumed.